Hi, everyone, again. Uh, Samir Menon, founder CEO of Dexterity. Uh, also, Stanford Computer Science PhD. Happy to be back. Thanks for your attention. Uh, it's uh, going to be a bit of a uh, journey from us through uh, what we call uh, intelligent automation today. And so uh, Dexterity has been working on the next generation of uh, intelligent machines, in particular intelligent robots that have the ability to pick, place, uh, pack, orchestrate, do a wide variety of things in the logistics industry. Uh, before I start, a quick overview of robotics. I know some of you are going to be familiar. Uh, robots have been around since the 1970s and the 1980s. Uh, the first wave of robotics was pretty focused on precision uh, and reliability, precision in the context of robots manufacturing things like automobiles. A robot would be a mechanical tool. You program it to do a certain task. There's a lot of math that you need to work through to get the robot to behave in the way that you want. A lot of that math is contained in aspects of control theory, motion planning. Long story short, you can imagine a manufacturing assembly line uh, where something comes along, the robot moves over, it does a task like welding a joint or drilling a hole or painting something, and the robot moves out of the way, the next thing comes along, the robot does the task again. Uh, the first generation of robots were really designed for precision, so they'd be big, heavy, um, kind of uh, extremely precise, and extremely precise in the world of robotics means like micron, some levels of, I don't know, 40, 50, some microns of precision. And the tricky part with that is uh, when you have precision as the foundation of the work that you are doing, uh, your precision, of course, depends on the, the effectiveness of the machine that you've built and the effectiveness of the control system, uh, but your precision is fundamentally constrained by the precision in the environment. So if the environment shakes around, you could be super precise, and unless you can react to the changing environment, your precision is wasted. Manufacturing as an industry was able to invest, say, I don't know, $50,000 to get a very precise robot and $5 million to build a very precise environment. And so with the $5 million and $50,000, you can have a functioning plant. Now you might imagine that, uh, you know, hey, I buy $50,000 of robot and I need to buy $5 million of uh, conveyor belt to make it work is not a very exciting uh, proposition for, for many, many circumstances. And uh, it is feasible to, uh, to take into production and, and do great things in the real world if you are in, in uh, uh, an environment where you're mass producing something. The moment you step outside manufacturing into the world of, say, logistics, and that's literally the first step outside the precise world of, uh, of machines, you suddenly encounter a scenario where everything's changing. There's still a big problem in terms of uh, the jobs to be done. And uh, robots are fundamentally unable to adapt to the variations in the environment. So when Dexterity started, uh, my background was in, uh, in control theory and simulation. Uh, we worked a lot on uh, robot dynamics algorithms. We worked on studying human motion, trying to build models that would allow us to transfer human skills to robots. Built some robots, programmed some robots, enjoyed my time here during my PhD. And uh, we came out into the real world where it was now incumbent upon us to solve problems. And when we think about solving problems, uh, there's a fundamental level of abstraction that we operate under when we are in uh, academia. And that level of abstraction kind of breaks because you're faced with the real world. And so what does the real world look like? And what is logistics? So logistics, uh, for, for many of us, is uh, something that, that sits behind uh, uh, you know, a cloud of uh, obscurity that uh, many of us are not particularly um, interested in, in, in penetrating. And at least I wasn't. And uh, uh, you, know, you, you order something on Amazon, you order something on any portal, magically a box shows up at your footstep. Uh, you walk into a store, uh, magically everything's there on the store shelf. Uh, but uh, you know, when, you, uh, when you think about what it takes uh, to, to take these items and get them into the store or get them to your home, uh, there's a behemoth effort at the back end, uh, a buzzing uh, sort of uh, you know, complex network of activity uh, that needs to be coordinated to take, say, an individual item. If you take almond breeze over there, uh, that almond breeze got manufactured somewhere. Uh, you know, your almond milk, your 15 different types of uh, milk and cream and butter 
and all of that, they all got manufactured in different places. And so when we think about logistics, the fundamental challenge over there is to take uniform sources of physical things and mix and match them into the right unit of combination that it will be delivered to an endpoint, right? This mixing and matching at a physical level is, is very difficult, very complicated, and quite expensive. All of that matters when it comes to making sure that we can buy our goods out in the real world or we can receive goods in our house. If it's too expensive, we get inflation, which we've been watching in the economy, it's not that great. The coronavirus pandemic came in, pushed the system to the limit, almost broke it, in some cases did break it, it's been recovering, we're seeing the consequences now. At this particular point of time, there's a huge opportunity uh, to go out safely, effectively, um, you know, do a big chunk of work that is required for the day-to-day -day functioning of our society and do it in a manner that constructively adds value. So that's what we're focused on. Um, let's add a little bit of additional context here. So if we take a news flash uh, over the past year or so, uh, there's been a pretty intense uh, labor shortage. So what does this mean? Uh, this means that uh, there used to be a bunch of people who were doing a variety of different tasks. And uh, the coronavirus pandemic hit. They went out of the workforce. A lot of them uh, thought about life. And there's this interesting phenomena called the great resignation that's been ongoing, where while you're in the rut, you're doing something. It's pretty cool. You don't think about it. You wake up in the morning. You go do something. Now you've been out of this uh, rut for about a year or two. You rethink life, and you decide, you know what? That task is something I should have never been doing. and I don't want to do it, and I will not go back to doing it. When you have a situation like that, uh, you, you end up in, in a situation where the job still needs to be done, but there's nobody waiting to do it. There's a constructive opportunity for robotics to enter our society where we can take automation in, get the job done, keep our stores functioning, keep our homes functioning, keep food on our plate, keep shampoo in our bathroom, and all of the cool stuff that we expect in a modern society and do it in a manner where the need is not necessarily disruptive. It's very important for robotics and automation and any technical change to be productive without being disruptive. I know if you folks will go out into startup plan, you know, there are like conferences called like tech disrupt. And so all of that sounds really cool, but uh, at the end of the day, you're gonna be interacting with uh, people, you're gonna impact lives. It's important for us to do that in a respectful, healthy and constructive manner. So for us, there's an opportunity right now to uh, change the status quo uh, to go out and uh, take robots into production, doing a wide variety of things that are traditionally pretty hard to do, traditionally uh, very labor intensive, and for us to do it in a manner where we constructively add value and we feel really good about it. So that's a bit of a, uh, a spiel from, uh, from me, and uh, uh, you know, just wanted to do, hand it over to a few other folks from Dexterity. We've been working on some exciting challenges in particular in the packaged baked goods industry, the packaged food industry. And through the pandemic, we were actually in production uh, with uh, all sorts of uh, uh, robots that were picking and shipping bread, buns, cakes. We've been in production with robots that uh, pick and sort parcels. Those two were things that were stretched to the max. You know, when the pandemic hit, uh, store shelves ran empty, there was no bread. There was uh, uh, you know, people were ordering everything online and the parcel system also got stretched to its limit. And so, there's some exciting uh, progress that we'd be happy to share. Um, but more importantly, I think there's a lot of open problems that have confronted us as we've taken ideas that were theoretical, that were decades in the making in the lab. We took them out into the real world, unwrapped layers of the onion, and we found extremely difficult problems continue to persist. And so we'd love to expose you all to another round of extremely difficult problems that for us emerged after we peeled the first couple layers of the onion with what we already knew. It's super exciting. It's a time of transformation. I think it's a time of global change. And I would encourage you all uh, to come join us or uh, do something uh, of your own accord. But uh, the time to go for robotics is about now. And let's take this opportunity to do something really cool. Handing it over to my yeah. colleague, Robert Sun. Robert. Yeah. Thanks, Samir. So my name is Robert. I'm one of the founding engineers at Dexterity. Um, also one of the Stanford alum uh, from uh, uh, Osama's Robotics Lab. I'm going to talk a little bit about why logistics is quite challenging for robots and how is it different than robotics used in the past. And one of the main things is 
every task that we do with robotics in logistics is going to be different, right? We have novel subtasks per action for pretty much everything that we, that we do with the robot. As you can see from this video, whether it's handling a new object, whether it's handling an object that can't be handled by other upstream uh, automation, you're going to be receiving new things or different things almost every single time uh, when working in production. And so this is greatly different from manufacturing or other applications of ro robotics when you have a very clear understanding of what your robot is going to do. And this really flips the problem, right? It makes it, you, previously you could verify that your solution always works, and now you have to, in real time, compute a solution for every new thing. Secondly, the environment that we want to put ourselves into for logistics is going to be unstructured. These are environments that were previously very human friendly, and there was no surrounding automation or anything that makes it easy for robots to work in. And to make it into an environment that robots can be easily operated in is, is actually quite difficult and potentially unachievable in environments where you're handling tons of packages or handling tons of messy uh, objects. And so this makes it that much more difficult for robots to operate in. And finally, as you probably saw in the video, we saw some various objects that are quite difficult for robots to operate in. And as you keep working in production, you start realizing there are some crazy things that show up that robots have to deal with. One time we saw someone ship a box of soggy cake. Or sometimes you're trying to pick up boxes and the UPS label is actually peeling off. And when you try to grip that object, the label peels off and you don't actually pick up these objects. And to make robots work and work properly for logistics applications, you really have to take into account all of the edge cases and make sure that you can handle each and every one of them for these systems to be successful. And this is why logistics is, is quite difficult and basically completely untackled by robotics, especially robots of the past. So what is Dexterity doing? Well, we've built up a platform of technology of a variety of different forms that I'll go into today that enables us to handle and tackle a lot of the logistics challenges we see today at relative ease. Uh, that doesn't mean that we are building custom things for each and every individual application. We are building up something that can be shared across 95% of applications, and engineers, programmers, software engineers can all use that platform and easily build and understand how to operate robots under logistics. One slide I'd really like to show is we take a problem first approach where we are not thinking of a lot of that technology that we learned in the past in school and try and apply it to every problem that we know. We look at the problems and then we take all of our knowledge, all of our technology and apply them to those specific problems. And if some technology does not work for that problem or some technology works better, we take that into account instead of trying to push you know, something like reinforcement learning to all the problems or trying to push control theory to all the problems. Right? We want to take a problem first approach. And we've built our platform with that in regard. And what are the components of this platform? Well, we've got a couple key components and I really want to emphasize sort of the full stack nature of what we build here. From building custom hardware and custom grippers and uh, a lot of custom electronics to really support the underlying base of our system, building low level control, adding perception and feedback to our control, uh, adding search, planning, and learning on top of that for some more intelligent interaction or more intelligent motion planning, and then tying it all together with some vision and understanding of the world so that we can properly create these plans. Some other components include teleoperation and human interaction with the robots. Inevitably, the robots will have to ask for help or maybe do something that is unachievable by the robots or just uh, in a regular workflow of things, need humans to insert or remove things from the system. So there's a degree of human-robot interaction uh, also involved, sometimes even over long distances or teleoperated. And then finally, there's, of course, tons and tons of software engineering required to glue all the pieces together to understand how you're going to deploy thousands and thousands of robots into the field without having a single engineer watching every single robot working, right? 
So what is this core platform fuel? We have a couple different products. Uh, as you can see here, the core platform really is able to work on all of these different products all at once. And uh, we'll see in depth a little bit, one of, these, one of these applications includes parcel induction. This is a process of taking these parcels and packages that you see uh, when you're shipping something with UPS, FedEx, USPS, and whatever, and we're taking these objects and putting them one by one on a conveyor belt in order to be sorted later downstream. Now, you see, this is, a, this is a task that's actually done by humans and in an incredibly constrained and small environment where there's not enough space for large automation, not enough space and time for si more simple or more you know, hard-coded automation to work. And you need something that will fall into place and do the job for you. Another um, big component or big, uh, big application is palletizing and depalletizing. And this, this problem is something that Jonathan uh, has been working on for quite a while. And it's a problem of taking these boxes that are of arbitrary shapes and sizes and creating a pallet of them. You've seen pallets before, maybe at a store or at, um, at a warehouse. And most of the time, the pallets you see are of the same size box, which makes it fairly easy to essentially hard code a pattern that allows you to fill this pallet up stably, it can be forklifted around. It uh, is highly efficient and doesn't have many gaps. But when the boxes come in a variety of shapes and sizes, it makes it extremely difficult to actually plan out how to put these boxes in place. It's, it's like playing chess, but then the moves you have are actually different every single time. And finally, uh, one of our big applications is called fulfillment. Now, normally, you might see robots in industry today pick and placing an object from a bin to another bin or vice versa. Fulfillment is a problem greater than that, where you are actually tasked to build an order where you have type A object, 100 of them, type B object, 500 of them, type C object, 300 of them, and you have 88 orders that you have to fill, two of A, three of B, five of C, right? And this type of behavior especially with multiple agents and multiple robots, is actually pretty hard to coordinate how to efficiently use your agents to fulfill this type of ordering. And so this is another level of sequential decision making that our robots will need to perform if you want to effectively and efficiently fulfill things like orders. And um, you can check on our website. We've been working on actually fulfilling some of the toughest orders, bread, white bread, whole wheat bread, whatever, whatever you name it. And <clears throat> These three main products have, have really been sort of what we see as in the logistics industry as some of the key things that warehousing and logistics actually works on and actually needs. And we've been tackling that for the last four years. So one question I wanted to answer for folks is, why is logistics and robotics, um, why now, right? And in my opinion, it's, it's a couple different things. I think imaging technology from the past 10, 20 years has not been great. But these days, from using real sensors, from using connects, from using other LIDAR and other imaging technology, we've seen a great improvement in the ability to understand the world, understand depth, understand color. And on top of that, we've been able to really commoditize segmentation and other learning algorithms to understand those images. From 2012, when AlexNet came to today, you can open up a Python notebook online and probably run a segmentation engine in like 12 minutes versus back then. I mean, took a whole PhD in eight years probably, right? Robotics hardware and compute today has also been greatly advancing. Compute finally has allowed us to run some of these modern methods in control that maybe you guys have been studying or researching, uh, RT algorithms and whatnot, Kunal will talk a little bit about in the in, in the later slides. Uh, all this together has really enabled us to piece together all the different components to make logistics possible to be achieved with robotics today. So we're going to talk about a couple of key components at Dexterity. Uh, in this talk, uh, we'll talk a little bit about imaging and perception and a little bit about control. So we'll talk about imaging first. So what are we doing with imaging, right? We need to understand where 
the objects are, what the objects are in the workspace we work in, and we need to understand how the robot can grasp or manipulate these objects, right? Sometimes we even need to understand if humans are operating within our environment, what are they doing, and how do we operate after a human has done something to our environment? There's a lot of different things that robots need to know, as you probably um, understand yourselves, about the environment and about perceiving obstacles or perceiving uh, other things that will influence the robot's motion planning, decision making, and whatnot. And our, our imaging systems, our perception systems, are going to have to provide the information for our robots to do this. We'll start with the actual imaging itself. We generally use you know, RGBD sensors to collect dense colored point clouds about the environment. Uh, we can use things like LiDAR and other things, but you know, we've found things like stereo, time of flight, structured light to be quite useful for us. And that allows us to see and understand exactly how the environment is shaped and what colors they are. And we can segment out, understand individual objects, create more rich data from this RGB data. You'll see also that certain sensors today also pose some challenges. When you're hitting objects like plastic bottles or glass or other transparent things, the results of these sensors might not be very great. And you might see things that are supposed to be right angles, but they are not. And you'll see interpolation error or other types of estimation error. And this is something that we have to deal with and understand. Right? We have to understand how this error will affect our estimation, and then go ahead and try to filter or deal with that so that we can better pick or better understand the collisions between objects. We've also noticed that in a logistics environment, things are going to be changing a lot. And sometimes you'll see nice, bright environments like this where everything can be seen. Maybe sometimes you'll see really dark environments where almost nothing can be seen. And this also poses a challenge on both the imaging and the processing front. Furthermore, you might also encounter other automation like scanners, safety systems that might affect your imaging. And we also have to understand how to deal with those other effects with our cameras or with our processing systems. And that's just a, a little bit of insight into sort of the real world examples of how imaging and how perception can, can be very difficult in a logistics environment. I'll just add a quick aside here where even once you do image or perceive the environment, there is, there's, a, there's a problem of transmitting that, signal to, transmitting that signal to our computers or to our servers for better computation. And one of the key problems that we've actually encountered is, do we use USB? Do we use Ethernet? Do we compute things on the edge? And these all offer different trade-offs in terms of price, performance, and reliability. And this is something to think of as engineers um, as, as we continue building this. Finally, we move on to the processing component. We want to take the perceived images and, our, and, and depth images and actually think about how to analyze or segment out the components in the real world. In this case, we do a lot of object segmentation. We understand what individual objects are. We can deproject them into three-dimensional pieces and then try to understand how best to grasp or how best to manipulate each of these independent pieces. You'll see we want to understand this on different levels. Either it's on a per-object level, either it's on a container level, you know, when we see trays or boxes. And then from there, we will then process out information like how to grasp this thing with one robot, maybe how to grasp this thing with two robots, or beyond. And the difficulty here lies that the amount of diversity in the object space is extremely large. And let's, let's look at bread, for example. I think we've seen thousands and thousands of types of bread in the world. And you are basically expected to operate on all of these products. I mean, if you put a human in this type of process, uh, you and I can tell whether something is a bread, something is a pita, something is a box of cake very, very easily. And you might think a computer should be able to generalize that as well. And again, with modern methods in CNNs and with segmentation engines, this is basically feasible now. And 
this just poses a, a data and um, processing problem, but um, again, one of these tough challenges in logistics. Another tough challenge is manufacturers or other companies will want to change the way that they display their product, change the labeling, add your favorite frozen character uh, after the holiday season, and your system will have to deal and adapt to that in real time. The same goes for packages and parcels. I think we've seen people ship seven jeans in a grocery bag once, and you're going to have to hand, not only segment that object, but handle it as well. And the parcel industry really just completely explodes in sort of diversity of the type of objects you're going to have to handle. And the problem is you're not going to be able to categorize every type of object. You have to create the right abstractions and the right categorizations from a robotics perspective so that you know how to handle each and every type of object. Maybe you want to split them out into boxes, flat mailers, bubble mailers, and try to categorize your objects based on that so you can create the right algorithms to handle each and every type of object. So just a little bit of insight into the type of, type of different things we have. Sometimes you'll just end up with a huge pile of very similarly shaped and colored objects, and that's it's extremely difficult for computers to handle, right? Uh, the, the texture difference is very minimal, and you'll really have to fuse together information from depth, from RGB, and maybe even uh, future, uh, future perception methods like material deciphering imaging, like, like IR or ultraviolet, to be able to detect between these different objects. What we've done is created a custom set of grippers and other hardware to be able to handle each and every type of object ourselves. And this is, I think, quite inter interesting in that it's not just about understanding what objects we're manipulating, understand the, understanding the individual types of objects, but also sort of reverse optimizing that all the way down to robot design and robot hardware design. And that's, I feel like, a super important piece of doing modern robotics is to start building the hardware to support the control, to support the perception, instead of relying on basic hardware to do all of that stuff. Finally, one last tidbit is we're also using perception to understand human actions. As you can see here, uh, these, these trays are actually inserted into our system uh, by a human. And they can actually be inserted one way or the, or the other way. You see, one side has a window and one side doesn't. So we're using perception systems to understand how a human inserts something into the system and how we might change our control and change our planning to adapt to that. So in that sense, you know, we have a very nice problem here where our robots are in production. We run tons and tons of operations on daily products, and we can easily see and capture data from that environment, hundreds of thousands of images, and we can create this virtuous cycle of machine learning, of um, detection of these objects, and continuously improve our systems. And so this, this creates a nice opportunity to do some interesting unsupervised learning or um, continuous improvement for our robots, and that's really it on our perception layer. Moving on a little bit to controls and planning. So we've, we've been working with control, controlling robots for a very long time. And control of robots, I think, is, is critical for dealing with logistics. You're doing a lot of manipulation with the environment. You're performing hard and soft contact. You might have multi-degree of freedom robots. You might have robots working together. And understanding and doing a really solid control uh, layer uh, for, for robotics is, I think, critical for the logistics industry. So what do we do? One of the key things is the environments are dynamic. Things are constantly changing. There might be disturbances. There might be packages falling into your view, and you have to adapt to that, right? And we want to create a control system that can move extremely fast to do tasks that are on par with the way that humans uh, do it. But we also want to change on the fly and comply with the environment. Unlike robotics of the past, where they were very, very stiff, had extremely high gains, and when something about the environment changed, the robot would, would crash, and an engineer or someone would have to come and try to fix it, 
our robots have to work all the time with these changing environments. Another thing is we want to combine in perception. And perception might include visual and might include force perception or touch-based perception. And you can see here, we're handling some extremely gentle product with a very powerful industrial robot. And that could easily crush or destroy anything, but you, once you combine in some perception, some force sensing, you're, you might be able to handle objects of all sorts. And this is, again, necessary for making sure your package arrives at your door <laughs> without it breaking, right? <clears throat> and finally, we want to create a system that is really open to everyone to use. And we want to create behaviors like this, where you can create some really interesting behaviors for robots where you can um, you know, ensure suction on these very difficult soft body objects. And you want to do this relatively quickly, in a week, in two weeks. And you don't want to spend a really long time designing optimization functions or constraints to be able to do this. And this is an interesting requirement that I guess rarely is, is talked about because engineering velocity is not really a, a research topic, but I think when you build systems that can support really strong and fast engineering velocity, it, it improves the ability for us to iterate on robot motions and other, other tasks very easily. So I'll talk a little bit about how we break down our control. Um, we start with a really rigorous whole body control method where with one, two, or multiple robots, we can define a hybrid force and motion control task. This allows us to easily uh, control specific tasks in the robot, maybe an end effector position task, maybe an orientation task, maybe a um, conditioning task to you know, put your robot in a better posture. On top of that, we'll put on trajectory tracking and different closed loop behavior that allows us to use that whole body control from before and track a planned trajectory later. And sometimes you're going to be deviating from that trajectory. Sometimes you're going to want to inject in perception to change the way that uh, you work on that nominal trajectory. And this might be done originally with heuristics. Then we might add some MPC or different things on it so that we can blend between trajectories or adapt to a changing environment in real time. And we want to also optimize and smooth the trajectories a little bit given, um, given initial planning. Finally, I think one key component is trajectory generation in and of itself. Trajectory generation, uh, traditionally you might think RRTs or other, other planning methods, don't really take into account the previous layers. And if we wanted to plan in joint space, that becomes infeasible. So how do we inject in some of the lower layer constraints or ideals so that we can properly plan and adapt for, for the environment. One thing that I'd like to touch upon here is this, this term SE3+. Plus. Um, so you might plan in per Cartesian and orientation space, but what if your robot had more joints or more ability to move? I mean, when you're playing tennis, uh, you're not just standing still and moving your arm right, you're moving your, your, your legs around, you're moving your body around to better condition yourself. And so the planning should really happen across this entire stack where you're thinking about how best to condition your robot for maximum utilization, maximum speed, while also planning the trajectory in and of itself. So that's why what I call sort of SC3+. Plus. And then finally, with all these layers together, you can start building behaviors on top of this robot. There's one more layer that I like to tell you about, which is sequential decision problems, where Yes, all of those planning, all of that control is very nice, but your robot still has to do something. Maybe palletize, maybe uh, sequence the objects we're placing on a belt. And sometimes these problems are, the actions that these problems have are sometimes going to be feasible or sometimes infeasible based on the control. Think about palletizing, for example. If we build a wall in front of us and try to reach over it, your robot arm is going to hit this wall. So we need to inject in some amount of heuristics or other planning or other learning about our sequential decision making to make it feasible for lower levels to execute that decision making problem. And this is a little bit difficult because you know you can't optimize the entire problem all the way through. You can't plan a robot trajectory every time you want to search for a better location for a box. And this makes it quite difficult to actually optimize 
the, this type of problem. The same goes for our scheduling problems. When we're talking about fulfillment, our robots have to figure out in a multi-agent capacity how best to move objects around and whether it's in singles or in groups um, with, the, with accounting for the fact that robot arms are still the ones that are doing it, these objects are not teleporting. So I hand it over to Kunal a little bit to dive a little bit into motion planning. That's what he's been working on a lot. Hey everyone, I'm Kunal. Uh, it's a graduate here like, what, six months ago, so it's kind of surreal to be on this side of the stage. So I'm gonna talk a little about motion planning today. <clears throat> so if you think about motion planning, it's a relatively straightforward objective. We have some box, bread, box, whatever thing, and we wanna move it from A to B, and we don't want to have any collisions, right? Relatively simple premise. And if you look at this video, we, the usage for this is sort of, we want, to work, we want this to work for all sort of planning tasks, and we want this to be a little bit customizable. So if you saw the motions here, replay the video. There's sort of different tasks going on here. The robot wants to pick up an individual object, a whole tray. It wants to move this, um, this red thing we call it the dolly, so there's sort of a different motion there. And it also wants to move the entire stack of bread closer to itself so it can reach for it. So how do you sort of build a system that can sort of do all of these tasks within sort of the same framework? And you don't necessarily want one method in your framework. If one type of motion fails, you want to fall back. You will eventually want to complete the motion so you don't have to get some human operator to come help. And today I'm going to be primarily speaking about geometric path planning. So what that means is we'll just modify the speed profile later. So we're mostly interested in some curve in space, P of S, and we'll deal with the speed S of T later. And the idea is that we're gonna let control handle the trajectory. Right now we wanna focus on the actual geometric path. So we've been doing motion planning for a while, and specifically in the realm of sampling-based motion planning, there are methods that you might be familiar with, RRT, AIT, FMT. And you might be thinking, well, you know, we've had these for 10 to five years, this should be great. If I just plug in OMPL, hit go, I should get a path. That's what I thought. But the answer is kind of no. Uh, you can give these methods seconds, tens of seconds, minutes, and sometimes they'll fail for even simple paths like this. And some of the underlying issues is that if we try to plan in joint space, well, it becomes a little difficult. We have limited, we wanna have limited planning time. We have maybe 100 milliseconds to do this motion. But how do we enforce sort of the world bounds, right? So the normal way people do this is you sample some joint space, some joint configuration, you check collision, and if that results in collision, you do rejection sampling. Rejection sampling works really well if the area you're sampling is relatively big to what you care about, right? If you're gonna reject rejection sampling 60, 70% of your points, it's not very useful as a method. But you can come in and try to find a path in just SE3, and again, we have limited planning time, these spaces are big, and the issue here is that we have many wasted samples. You might imagine if you're picking up you know, an object from here to here, there's no real sense in me sampling orientations that are like sort of wacky pointing upwards, right? We kind of want to like have orientations that make sense, maybe a little bit in plane, out of plane, but not completely upside down. That would just be silly. And that kind of comes into this idea of position-based orientation sampling, where really what we're doing with motion planning is we have so not only a goal, point, a goal start state, and um, we also have a goal orientation. So the idea here is that we can like sample points. We also wanna sample their orientation, so fully sampling the state here. And the way we do this is we sample Cartesian points sort of normally, how you would imagine you have some bounding box, you sample from there, uniform Gaussian distribution. And the idea is then you can use this to get sort of the approximate distance of that position to the start and end, and you can use this for some sort of interpolation strategy, right? So you can imagine if I have two orientations, I can linearly interpolate between them over some basis, or their angle, quaternions, whatever you want. Or you can get a little bit fancy with your interpolation strategies and you can use things like sigmoids. And sigmoids are nice because what they let you do is they let you do most of the orientation in the middle. 
And if you imagine for things like palletization or bread, where the final and initial orientation is really, really relatively constrained, right? You want to pick them up straight. You want to drop them in straight. So if you need to rotate them, you want to do most of that sort of in the middle. So if you look at this video, got away here. So you'll see that we're going to pick up the box. We're going to do most of the orientation sort of in the first 30 to 60 percent. And then towards the end, we've sort of settled on the final rotation. And if you look really closely at this box, you might be wondering, well, the box is symmetric. Why are we even rotating it, right? There's no real need for me to do that maneuver. I can sample in R3. It'll be great. And unfortunately, we're not necessarily doing these motions in a vacuum, right? We're doing them between between successive pick and places, and we have all of these cables and whatnot attached to the robot itself. We need to be cognizant about not over rotating the gripper. If we can't, we can't just rotate completely continuously in one direction, it'll get tangled, air pipes will break, everyone's sad, you call the mech team, they're mad at you. You don't want to do that. So what we want to do is we want to take these ideas and somehow put them into the motion plan. And this kind of calls back to this SE3 plus idea where we're not necessarily just playing in one specific space, we have other constraints and we need ways to deal with those constraints in sort of the same con continuity. So how does this position-based orientation sampling work? Well, the, the idea here is relatively simple. We can use an axis angle method to do this. So we have some start orientation S, some goal orientation G. We can get the relative orientation between them. If you're not familiar with quaternions, you can think about these as rotation matrices. The math is more or less the same. We can find the angle and axis of this rotation. So every three dimension rotation has a principal axis. There's a rotation about and some angle that rotates through. And we can create some sort of sampling method about this. So we can add a little bit of noise to this axis and we can add a little bit of noise to the angle itself. So we return a sampled point based on some interpolation strategy. And this is really nice because it lets us sort of bias the orientation towards some sort of nominal path, right? We have some path that we think is relatively straightforward, but we still want this like nice sampling based nature about this point. So it helps us sort of wiggle out of tight situations. And this dramatically can reduce the time, take, time needed to find these paths. So in this example here, um, we have some trajectory that we're trying to plan, some orientation we're sweeping through. This is sort of the graph of the angle about this principal axis. I didn't want to plot too many things here. The idea here is that we can basically follow whatever nominal path we want and add a little bit of noise to help us wiggle out of these sort of tight corner situations to create these sort of collision tree collision free trajectories um, quite quickly. Another method we have is this uh, cone based method. I don't have fancy names for these quite yet. Uh, so the idea here is that we can define a per axis distribution. So if you think about Euler angles, you can think about a per axis distribution here. And the idea is to simply just parameterize the variance. So you have very little variance at the beginning and ends of these trajectories. And most of your orientation is happening in the middle or whatever, according to whatever parameterized variances you have. So you'll see at the ends, there's no orientation motion here. And then as we get towards the middle of this trajectory, there's a lot more, um, <clears throat> a lot more sampled points. And this helps with more exploration in the middle. That's normally where you have the most free space to move around without collisions. And again, all these points are being collision checked, but there's still some level of rejection sampling happen, but at a much, much lower rate. And this is really helpful for what we call top-down situations, which is what you've seen with the palletization robot, which is what you've seen with the bread robot, is a lot of these um, actions have very little world pitch and roll. So if you're picking up a box and you're going to place it, you, there's no real reason for you to tilt it a whole bunch out of plane. You're going to mostly just want to rotate them. So the underlying idea is to just bias your sample towards rotations that make sense for the actual task at hand. So an example of this is our palletization robot. And if you can look closely, there's a little bit of pitch and roll happening. But for the most part, most of the orientation that's happening is in the world you're offering. And this lets us dramatically, this two dimensions you're basically getting rid of, which is incredibly helpful for solving these problems in tens and hopefully maybe even ones of milliseconds. And what does this finally relate to? Well, this relates to boxes, right? We're moving boxes. 
We've been looking at boxes since we were like two. Why are boxes so hard? Well, unfortunately, oh, this image doesn't show up. Um, there's a lot of boxes that just like are completely unreliable. There's tape in the way, there's holes. If there's a hole in the box and you try to apply suction, it's not gonna work, these sorts of things. And you wanna develop motion planning and control and grasping techniques that can handle these sort of like edge cases, the long tail of these boxes. And again, you're not only operating on these like weird boxes in a vacuum, right? They're interacting with each other. You get a whole bunch off some pallet or something, and then you start stacking them, and then these sort of like errors keep adding up, and you get like wacky things like this, right? And it's not just these deformed boxes. There's also, people ship crazy things, mattresses, kayaks, like, imagine you're the guy who has to put the kayak in like a pallet or a truck, right? That's like really, really difficult. So how do you come up with a robotic system using all of our representations of geometry and data to successfully complete these tasks in a reasonable amount of time without having to call a human operator every five minutes? So now for that quick, quick uh, intro on our motion planning. So one thing I just want to stress is we really take this full stack, full stack approach to robotics, right? We know that robots working in the logistics world is going to be a really tough problem given the changing environment, given the constantly changing tasks and different things that are thrown at us. And just trying to solve it in certain layers in perception or certain layers in control or certain layers in motion planning is, is not going to cut it. And you might, I'm not gonna say it's impossible, but you, you might spend 20 years doing one thing versus a month changing a gripper. And so I think to reduce the friction in providing robots that work for our logistics customers, it's extremely important to try to optimize at whatever layer on the stack as needed to solve these types of problems. These types of problems, we need to provide a sort of turnkey solution for our customers, right? And if you provide a robot that just does one thing and people keep needing to feed it or um, it's, uh, it can only pick and place one thing but it doesn't fulfill an order, this doesn't really solve the problem. And you need to provide this whole entire solution, the peripherals, the safety, the perception, all of it combined in order to actually make a difference in the logistics world or in any world with robotics, to be honest. And I think this makes, this makes tackling this problem actually extremely difficult. And that's why at Dexterity, we've really employed a wide range of people from motion planning and trajectory optimization experts, sequential decision making experts, mechanical engineering experts, design experts, every, everyone from every field to be able to tackle this entire problem to actually make a difference, to give robotics the justice it really deserves after 20 to 30 years of stagnation in manufacturing and, and take it into the real world. <clears throat> so, like I said, it doesn't just end at robotics. Things like software engineering, motor design, game playing, and a variety of different types of fields all really play together to enable robots and massively fleet deployed robots out in the field to work effectively. So Dexterity is taking this full stack approach to robotics and hopefully you guys understand why we're doing that and maybe be able to make a difference as well. Thanks everyone. So I'm just gonna put up some names of these people if you wanna contact them. Um, for some information. Uh, myself, I work primarily on whole body control. Kunal works on motion planning. Jonathan works on sequential decision making problems like the palletizing or uh, scheduling problems. Uh, Andrew Bylard works on trajectory optimization. And we got Lynn, who's also um, a Stanford alum, not here today. She works a lot on computer vision. Folks, uh, Samir again, uh, just wanted to say thank you very much for listening in. Our goal in this uh, presentation was to give a high-level overview uh, of some of the things that are very difficult in logistics. A quick snippet of a few different things that we've been doing, in particular handling boxes, packages, uh, packaged baked goods like bread. A bit of a deep dive into the nuances of a particular problem, which we saw uh, is something as simple as picking up a box and putting it on a pallet is actually far more complex than we can imagine. 
I think the takeaway message uh, that I would love for you folks to take uh, from this talk is that robotics has, has, you know, it's an onion, there's many layers. You might think you have an optimal sort of idea or a framework to solve all of robotics. Um, that's great, you put it into production, you go to 95%. What you have to do is you have to rescale your 95% back to five, and you take that remaining five, and that's your new 95%. So you go there again, and then you do it again. You do it again and again and again and again, you have to do that many, many, many times before you actually end up at, uh, at, at something that you can say works in the real world. It's extremely hard. Uh, there is no shortage of very, very difficult theoretical engineering, uh, pragmatic challenges that you'll face. It's an exciting field for people to come in and do work. I think for the next 10 or 20 years, we'll be working at the cutting edge, no matter where you're working on robotics. So I would strongly encourage you to come uh, join us or you know, do something in robotics yourself. We are super excited about robotics. And as you can see, it's a bit of a Stanford team here. You know, we have Robert, Gunal, uh, me, Andrew, Jonathan, and uh, we have Haumia Huang, uh, who is now an investor at Kleiner Perkins, also invested in Dexterity, a Stanford PhD as well. So all the best, good luck, and thank you for your attention.